Hello and welcome to your weekly roundup of all things electric from the team at electrifying.com. On the podcast today, we'll be discussing how Alfa Romeo ended up in a spot of bother with the Italian government, a new £25,000 electric car from Citroën and smiley Volkswagens, and who doesn't love the thought of a smiley VW? Welcome to the Kilowatt Half Hour. I am Ginny. I'm Tom. And I'm Mike. Hello, everybody. Hello, gang. I haven't been here for a couple of weeks. I have missed you. Oh, we missed you too. And we've had a very busy post bag, so we'll be going through that as well and also yeah. um, answering all your car buying conundrums because we're getting we're getting a great post bag, aren't we? We're getting some lovely, lovely comments and questions in from you all, so please do keep those coming. If you are watching on YouTube, you can put them um, in the comments below. If you're listening on your normal podcast platform, whichever one that might be, you can actually email us and we've got our own fancy email now, haven't we, Mike? We have podcast at electrifying.com is the new um, email oh. address for anything that we've got uh, to do with uh, questions about cars, questions about charging, anything about electric cars, anything about the podcast, podcast at electrifying.com. And just, yeah, let, let us know what your thoughts, what you're, what's going on with you as well. What are you thinking of the cars you're driving? We love to hear from you. So I feel a little bit out of it because I've been off doing some other bits and pieces for the last couple of weeks. I've been all over the place. But the one thing that has kept popping up on our team WhatsApps <laughs> is Alfa Romeo. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. They've got in a bit of trouble, haven't they? Yeah, they uh, well, they had to change their name. Well, they didn't have to. They said they but, did it all of their own accord, didn't they? But yeah. uh, the, the the little small car, the little SUV, was called the Milano. They sent out all the press materials, the invitation, everything, and then at the last minute, they changed the name to Junior. And Paul Nicola went out to go and film that car in a studio. And I think that they were still pulling the old badges off and there were still some Milano uh, <laughs> signs and things around. I think the placemats where she had lunch still had Milano on them. I told her to pinch them to put them on eBay. But, uh, <laughs> Honestly, yeah, they could... yeah. It's it's a crazy thing. So this is all down to this thing called appellations of origin, isn't it? Which is basically this ruling that things have to. Well, this is what the Ital this is what the Italian yeah. government were trying to say. So basically, there's this thing called appellations of origin, which means that. If you produce Parma ham, it has to come from the Parma region in Italy. If you produce champagne, it has to come from the Champagne region. So it was all done to this. So what they've tried to say is that because Alfa Romeo are not actually building the car in Italy, it's being built in Poland to save money, um, that they're not allowed to call it the Milano, given that the Milano is, of course, Italian. And it seemed a bit ridiculous when it first came out, but they have indeed backed down and had a bit of a hissy fit and renamed it the Junior, which I think is just an awful name. I don't know. What do you I, I, honestly? All I can think about is a few footballers that use the Junior bit. I can think of that yeah. Schwarzenegger movie, no, no, no Schwarzenegger movie. It just does. It just doesn't. The Junior of what? It just doesn't seem to make... I mean, I know there is a historic connection. I get that, but I just I'm not so sure that was the right name. Um, and in fact, if you did have a better name for that car, let us know. Send us an email. Let us know in the comments below. Uh, I think yeah. it could be, yeah, I, th I think between us all, we could have come up with a better name than the Junior. Yeah, it's quite an aggressive looking car as well. It doesn't really suit Junior. You don't it expect doesn't, Juniors doesn't. to look like that rrr, rrr, look, do you? It's, uh, it is a bit strange, but uh, I mean, the, the press release that we got announcing this change was all very sniffy. It, it was it was kind of saying, oh, well, we don't really mind. Thank you for all the publicity, Italian government. Uh, it, uh, really? It was, it was very it was very defensive, wasn't it? Mm. I think is the word that we were looking for. But I think you're right. I think the car itself is also quite divisive. Um yeah. I know Nicola has had some mixed opinions. It's a brilliant video, by the way, that video. If you haven't seen it, if you're here on YouTube, then make sure you check it out. And if you're listening, um, as I say, on a, on your um on your podcast um platform, then go over to electrifying.com and just go to the Milano review and Nicholas video is in there because it's very funny. But I think I, I'm listen, I, I, I haven't seen it in the metal. It's a lot smaller. I think she was saying in the metal than it looks in, in the picture. She was quite surprised by how small it was, but it's that kind of the front that is dividing opinion. I don't know. What do you make of it, Mike? Do you, do you like well, it? Do you not like it? 
I don't, I don't mind it. I think it's one of those cars you do need to see in the metal to, to really... And that front grille is going to be very light dependent because they they seem to have shot a lot of it from behind, so you can't see that kind of um, grille. And it's the um, it's the old sort of... Um, it, it's not particularly nice. It's a, it's a snake eating a baby, isn't it? Is the kind of uh, logo. <laughs> That's lo- <what> it <laughs> it's just, and it's, yeah. it's enormous. It's the size of a dinner plate on the front of it. But, I mean, that name is cursed for Alfa Romeo because in, in 2010... The car that became the Giulietta uh, was originally supposed to be called Milano as well. Um, again, 11th hour change because a year before Alfa Romeo had closed the factory, their last, well, the original factory, Alfa Romeo factory in Milan, they closed that factory. And, and it was considered to be in poor taste to, to then name the car after that factory when you weren't going to build it there. So I think they kind of slightly took that one on their own. Uh, decision not to call it that but I, I you can't imagine that ne- the next car they bring out some wag is going to say in marketing i think milano is good for this car and they're just going to get thrown <laughs> out on there because there is absolutely the amount of money that it must have cost to rebrand that twice and some of you know you look at the magazines on the newsstand where they all had to go to press before this change if mm. you look on you go to the supermarket this weekend and look at all the car magazines a lot of them will say new alfa and milano because it was changed so late that a lot of things would have gone to press um, so yeah, but I mean, it's not the first, you know, car name that's changed yeah, think, at the eleventh hour. Oh you know. really? Go on. Which other car names oh, have changed at eleventh hour? What's I did a bit of research favorites? on this because I'm quite interested. The big one is, is and it, it didn't really change at eleventh hour, but the Ford Focus, nineteen ninety eight. Um, I don't know if you remember, you, you both of you. Ford had three three names under consideration for the car. The car became the Focus, Fusion, Icon, and Focus. Fusion was leaked to the press. Uh, about three or four weeks before, and the boss, Jack Nasser, went absolutely mad about it. So, so he said, right, I'm not going to tell anybody what the name of the car is. And when he said anybody, he meant even the people he worked with at Ford. So even the night before the Geneva Motor Show, nobody knew the name of that car. And it was only when Jack Nasser oh, really? sat at dinner with the staff and said, it's going to be Focus. And what they'd done, Ford, Ford marketing and PR team had to get 15 photocopiers in because they had to print the press packs in five different languages and do a massive search and replace, find and replace in all the documents to put the real name in. So it wasn't just the press that were being kept out of the loop in terms of the name. They had three cars all badged up with the three different names. So yeah, That's it's you know, car naming is a whole new world, isn't it? So it's, it's, su- it, it's such a difficult one. And I know we've talked on the podcast before about ridiculous names. You know, there are so many nuts names out there. I think it, the one we all love the most <laughs> is potentially the Mazda Bongo. Bongo but Brawny. what about names that you like? There's my question to you guys. What off the top of your heads is your your favourite name for a car? Is there something that would make you go, oh, I want to see that car, I want to buy it, I want to drive it? Put you on the spot. Sorry, should I, should I show you mine? Because obviously the reason yeah, I asked that question is because I've got one. Tell us what yours is. Okay. I really love the fact that the Renault 5 in America was just called Le Car when it went on sale. I just think it is utterly brilliant. It's such a sort of clever piece of marketing. I think it just really suited the car. I think it, I thought it was, I think it's just fantastic. Um, so that was one of the ones that I really liked. And I, I, I did ask um, if they were going to bring a version back there. Sadly, they're not selling it in America, but I'm sure there will end up being some versions that will be badge the car. There's got to be. And actually there was a funny comment in, on Nicola's YouTube video that I saw today, uh, which was saying that, he, this particular person had, had just put a comment and saying he absolutely thought there's going to be an af- a market and aftermarket accessories for badges that say Milano for the junior, yeah. with mm-hmm. people swapping <laughs> out the junior for the Milano. So Le Car Alf- gets my vote as my my best my best okay. name. I love it. I, I bet Alpha have got a warehouse full of Milano badges somewhere. That's probably <laughs> sure. why they did it though. They probably have them from the Julietta but- debacle. <laughs> Ah, they'll all be popping yeah. up on eBay. Does it start to get rid of this? Got to get rid of these badges there. somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Any, any? Have you got anything to throw in for the favourite car name? Oh, well, I quite like the kind of the old ones, like Triumph Stag. That's quite you know, <laughs> purposeful, isn't it? Purposeful. It's, 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 <laughs> and, and Austin Healy Sprite. Those sort of Sprite Stag. That I, I like those kind of names. Yeah, Spitfire. Oh, yeah, Tell you like. something about what it's meant to be like. Spitfire. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, yeah. I, I think for me, I would, I like, uh, which is going to make a comeback, isn't it, this year? The Fiat Topolino, which is uh, Italian mm. for That's little a mouse. a lovely little name. It's... Little mouse, yeah. which I think is a lovely little name. And I think it just sort of it just suits a little, 
knowing Stellantis and Fiat, they'll probably attach it to a seven seater SUV and call it Topolino and think it's <laughs> a secret. But uh, it'd be not, I think it's, it's actually going to come back on this on the sort of uh, Fiat's version of the Citroen Ami, isn't it? That's yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, that's mm. that's mm. a cute. It suits it. The names that I was really sad to get back was. Um, we're going off electric cars completely, but the Sorry. Puma, because I remember the four, the original Ford Puma and the yeah. racing Puma version of that, which was utterly just brilliant, such a kind of lively car to drive. And I really, I really like the design of that car designed by Ian Callum, who I just think is a super talented designer. And then they bought the Puma back, didn't they? And it was just yeah. a bit like, oh, how could they do that? And the same, I guess, with the Mustang. Should that name ever have been brought back for that car? No, lots of no. shaking our heads here. No, the electric think. Mustang was just, its it, what's happened to the electric Mustang? <laughs> Does anybody about. own an electric Mustang? Let us know. It's one of those cars, electric cars that I've kind of forgotten. Mm. I forgot all about that until we just mentioned it then. Have I, I, I have you thought about Ford, the Mustang? Ford's we generally say? forgotten about electric cars anyway, hasn't it? I mean, oh, it where has. are they all? Yeah, what, yeah, honestly. Where's the electric I, Puma? Where is the electric Puma? But it's like come, the old original Explorer. Puma, like a car mm. that's fun to drive. I think Ford are a basket case when they come to electric cars. And I think I think they could be in really big trouble if they don't nail it. They're already in big trouble, aren't they? They're losing loads of money. And they're definitely not nailing it with electric cars. Anyway, right. interesting. what were we I, supposed I, to be talking yeah. about today? Because it wasn't this, was it? I've got a, I've got a, I've got a Mustang thing that I, I've just I've just come back. I've just um, had a few days in uh, in Greece, in Rhodes. And um, the cars around there, they're generally speaking 20, 30 years old. All the paint's de under the sun. You know, they're usually, there's, if you like old classic cars, and not so much classic cars, but kind of modern classic cars, you think, oh my goodness, like you, Tom. There was loads. I mean, every other car was was beaten up and had three at two headlights and missing and that kind of thing. But the, <laughs> there was a standout and there was two Mustang mach sort of <laughs> parked in the same road. So, you know, hats off to the Ford dealer there. If you managed to, you know, I don't think it was str- struggling to sell new cars in, in Greece, I'd imagine just... But the, the Ford dealers obviously managed to find customers for two Mac E's, which I thought was uh, very impressive. I didn't see a single charging mm-hmm. point while I was there for for a week. So um, yeah, I hope they're making it work. But it just seemed a very strange standout thing. But anyway, I think see. there was a press release about Citroen Ami police cars in Rhodes, wasn't there, when it first came out? Did you see any of those? I didn't see any. Of that. I did see. I did <laughs> I see. I love a couple that of idea. Families. But yeah, I can imagine it would work in the old town. It would work because it, it's you know quick walking is mm. quicker than driving. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let, let's let's move shall on now, shall we, from our kind of musings to some actual news about what's happening this week. And we've seen the uh, Citroen EC3 Aircross, which is the sort of slightly sort of chunkier version of the EC3, which we will be driving very soon. And I'll actually be going out to look at the Aircross soon. And pricing for that around twenty five thousand pounds. Okay, I yep. think you know, I think that's okay. That could obviously could be could be less, but I think we were, you know, reasonably pleased with that news. Um, and but Tom, you made quite an interesting observation, didn't you? Because you were studying well, the press pictures. Well, I studied the pictures and looked at the specs and thought, oh well, okay, this is the same normal Stellantis platform. It's got that fifty-four kilowatt hour battery. And then I looked at it a bit closer. I thought, hang on, have I seen this car before somewhere? And if you look at that and the new Vauxhall Frontera next to each other. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they've got different front and back ends, but they've got the same doors, they've got the same C-pillar, so it's basically the same car, but oh, they've kind of hidden it with a two-tone roof on the Citroen and a few other little bits and pieces, but that's how they save costs, isn't it? That's how yeah. you can make a car, which is 25 grand, an electric car, that's that big, is by sharing stuff like that, so... um it's an interesting thing that they've done. I suppose it's going to be okay, but in some ways you think, are they losing their character? You know, is it going to be like their vans where they're basically the same with front, different badges and front and back ends? I don't know. Mm. I don't know how I feel about it, but uh, I suppose yeah. if you get better cars and better value. It's it's definitely how they're bringing prices down, isn't it? And I guess if we go back to the Milano, sorry, the what is it the junior, junior. the junior mm. milano mm. the junior um that's sharing of course so much with the jeep avenger which is a car that we really love and also the fiat 600 e so and it, it's how these big groups are able to i mean not that you know electric cars we know still are more expensive than their petrol and diesel counterparts but this is how stellantis for example is able to get those prices down because it's sharing so much of the underpinnings and interesting we've got nikki at the moment who's driving the mccann really important car for porsche and again you've driven the the q6 e-tron tom already and and mm. those cars will share, just will share so much technology won't they 
Yeah, they will do. And I think that that's that's how you can get the better technology on something like an Audi and a Porsche. But I think on those two cars, they'll the engineers will do quite a lot of different stuff to make them feel different. Yeah. Will a, a Vauxhall feel any different to a Citroen? I don't know. Maybe they'll tweak some bits, but... Uh, yeah, I think this is where it'll be interesting with the junior because they're they're talking a big talk, aren't they, about how it's going to drive and how brilliant it's going to feel. Is it going to feel so much different to the Avenger or the 600e? I mean, you would hope so, but it'll be interesting to see if that actually translates because I think that's one of the things that um, that VW Group did incredibly well with the e-tron, the Audi e-tron GT and the Taycan, when you drive those cars, they do have different mm. characteristics, don't they? They do feel, it, they were the first two cars that I really thought, yes, you can really give electric cars that individual personality because I think the engineers managed to do that really well with those two. Yeah, definitely. So that was Tom's observations of the week. Mike, what's caught your eye in the news this week? Well, um, it's good news, if you like. We were talking about faces and fronts of cars and everything, uh, and names we like. Well, Volkswagen are, have kind of made it a mission to make their new cars, new electric car, their ID models, smile more. They're going to be more friendly. Yay. They're going to have a bit more connection with you as if you look at them. So um, Stefan Wahlberg, who is the head of exterior design, um, has said that starting with the ID2, uh, you could argue, you see, he's argued it did start with the buzz in so much as that's got a big old smiley face, especially when you look at it with a two-tone paintwork. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're all going to be more friendly. They're going to smile a bit more. Because if you look at an ID3, it looks lovely, but it slightly looks like the kid at school who wasn't allowed scissors. You know, it does that kind of slightly odd sort of look um, to him. Um, but mm-hmm. so the, the new ones are going to be a lot smiley and they're going to have a lot more of an emotional connection with, with, with the person who owns it. I guess the, the, you look at a car and you always, and I think... Fiat have always done that really well, haven't they? 500 looks nice. It looks like it's smiling. It has a nice face. So, you know, I think that's obviously the direction they're going. Slightly more worrying is that he said they're going to use some of the playful, I hate that phrase, playful features that was in the concept car. So you're pulling faces now. You know what's coming. On the infotainment system, as it boots up, you're going to get a wolf from Wolfsburg, obviously doing a nice stretch as he wakes up and everything, which will be entertaining and interesting for maybe the first three no. times you have it. Three years no, down the no, line no. when that wolf's still stretching where you... <laughs> can they you need imagine? to have a word with smart. smart. They've got a... T- smart has the fox. The fox. The really There's something annoying else though. There's a, a tiger or a leopard, I think. Yeah, I think it's a leopard on the, leopard on the three three hydro. Hydro. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the fox with it, with, and it bounces a ball around, doesn't it? Flips yeah. So you're going to have a wolf. That, you can have the Wolfsburg wolf. Um, oh, I just want—I just like an this. infotainment system that booted up quickly rather than having someone spend time animating mm. a wolf. But, can, uh, can they just maybe. think about putting some lights behind the haptic buttons so you can see them in the mm. dark instead of wolves? You'll get buttons. That might You're, be a good starting off point. Yeah, I think I think we're going to see quite a bit of change with ID, aren't we? Because Andreas Mint, who took over, yeah. um, you know, from the head head of Volkswagen, he's very much a kind of tactile guy, and he wants to put buttons back in. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's we're going to start to see that. I mean, there's always a lag, isn't there? There's always a three to six year lag. There you is. Know, anything, any project that's already been started has got to be finished with whatever it was designed with. But I think from probably ID2 onwards, you're going to see a lot more, I wouldn't say retro, but perhaps, you know, there's a pushback, isn't there? We, I mean, we've discussed buns and I'm fed up talking about it, but it's um, you are going to see a lot more tactile, uh, mm-hmm. you know, part of design coming back into the cars, I think, which is going to be a good thing, isn't it? I was looking at the um, the ID2 actually again just the other day, just like looking through photographs of it, and I mm. think it was when we got that story from Steve up on the site. And I actually like it so much more now than I did when we first saw it. Mm. Oh, because I think we all thought it was really, really a bit dull, didn't we? And then everybody yeah. loved it. It got amazing response on social. Yeah. Um, but I do. I'm quite excited about seeing that car. I. I don't know if what that says about me particularly. I don't know, but it, it's not the most, you know, visually, you know, exciting thing you've ever seen. But I am, I am looking forward to seeing it. I think it's going to be a really cute little well-built thing. Well, that's what my hopes are, anyway. I yeah, I mean, I, I, I drove. A, I've, I've had in on loan a, a Volvo um, XC40 recharge, um, which isn't, you know, in in its first flush of youth. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing. Uh, Tom and I were discussing it earlier. I know. It very much feels like an electric car from a slightly 
era before us in so much you know tom and i were both saying you get into it and it doesn't have a screen that's the size of a television set it's a just perfectly perfectly sized screen and it has buttons and it has and it feels like the slightly kind of a generation of volvo that the ex30 is moving away from and really really comfortable seats and and you could tell it was old because it had like a blanking plug where the initial ignition key used to be so you know it is clearly is an older car but and I won't, I'm not going to go off off topic here, but as the as the best thing <laughs> I've come across an electric car or any car in a long while, if you turn the heated seat and the heated steering wheel on, it only goes off when you turn it off. So when the car switches off and you get back in it again, they come on again. You know, oh, my, that's because my Hyundai, like a lot of cars, if you do, if you switch it off, if you you go to the paper shop or they're going to bo- bottle of milk from the start, you got to you have to go and pr- switch it all back on again. Which in the Hyundai is really annoying because you have got to go through th- two different menus to get to it. So just leave it on. If I want heated seats on, leave it on. I leave it on. Interesting. So yeah, it does that. So it's I gone d- to the top I- of my list. I mean, just thinking about that, you that comment that it, it is, it's like a proper car, isn't it? That, mm. that car it, 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 with a slightly charming, you know, yeah. more traditional feel. I really liked it. Are any of the people who actually go to Volvo, gravitate to Volvo because mm. of that, are any of those buyers going to really want the EX30? Because it is so pared back and different. It's going to be really interesting to mm. see if existing Volvo owners make the switch into that car because it's completely different to anything they've done before. Yeah. And I'm not mm. I'm not convinced they will, to be honest. No, no. They're, they're probably looking for younger buyers, aren't they, who like that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Anyway, sh- shall we move on yes. and to... Post bag and to the absolutely brilliant, <laughs> named, um, I didn't name it, so I can say I that, did. Barnard's Bargain Bevs. So <laughs> yeah. come on, Tom, what you've been looking, you know, it's all you do, mm, isn't it? It's a thing, really? doesn't look it? At, look it is, the... it's all I do. Well, well, the, the biggest bargain I saw all this week is uh, an old EV. So I have been investigating how much my car might be worth. So I looked on the auction sites. Uh, to see how much old Leafs are worth. And there was one on there which uh, was a very, very early car, so 2011 uh, Leafs, so one of the the launch cars, uh, built in Japan. And obviously they're getting on a bit. And this one had just under 100,000 miles. The battery life wasn't looking that great, so I think something had broken on it. But it still had, I worked out, about 40 miles of range. Now that's not a whole lot, obviously, but... If you're poodling around, if you've got a, a commute that you know, 40 miles is going to be fine, isn't it? You can just plug it in at, 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 uh, at the end of the day. And the hammer fell on that car for £830 wow. Wow. for a Nissan Leaf. Now, you'd have to pay the fees on top of that, but it would still be about 1200 quid, I suppose, if you drove it away. And I'm just like, well, I could have the wheels off that and I could have it. But the battery pack's got to be worth that alone. But for somebody, yeah. that is going to be a very cheap way of getting around because it's zero road tax and yeah. uh, it, it's you can fill it up for you know, probably a quid a, a day and then drive backwards and forwards to work. Yeah. That's I suppose seriously the ch- cheap motoring. I suppose the challenge, I think, for anybody with that is that thought that, okay, it's got the 40 miles of range now. What's it going to have in winter, for example? And then how much lower is it going to go? But I guess for that money, you've still got an awful lot of scrap left value left in the battery yeah, alone. Exactly. I mean, it must be worth that to, in, in parts. If you if you put that yeah. on eBay with nothing, it's going to be worth that. So I was like hovering on the bid button for that, but thought, <laughs> no, life would kill me. <laughs> um, and again, I've been kind of looking at, at new stuff and the cheap auras are back. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. uh, uh, sensible, sensible lease, you know, with sort of 8,000 miles a year. Um, and they are 164 pounds a month. Oh. And then, but then doesn't that actually come in around the same price as a, a Citroen Ami? Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah, the thing on the best. leasing pages. Yeah. You look at, you put yeah. it like lowest price and there's, a Citroen Ami with 5,000 miles, and then there's a, a an Aura with 5,000 miles. Um, and the, the, yeah, they're very similar money. So, I mean, the Aura is a, you know, a, a proper car, uh, would, in inverted commas. Um, so right. I'm, the, I'm going to move us on now to the post bag. Um, so we are going to uh, say hello to Glenn, who um, I think has emailed us, actually, at podcast.electrifying.com. 
Glenn, one of the first people to make the use of our shiny new email. Welcome, Glenn. Yes. Um, so Glenn says, I've just made the switch to an EV. Proud owner of a new BMW iX3, which I love. Nice. Great, choice. Yeah, great choice. I followed your podcast, YouTube, which is where I learned a lot before taking the plunge. Thank you. That's exactly what we love to hear. So Glenn's question, for 95% of my journeys, including work, I will only ever charge away from home. What's been holding me back until now is the fear of longer trips and planning stops midway if my app doesn't work or the charges are queuing if you've got any advice for newbies trying out a first longish trip that will definitely require a stop something we've all got experience of all three of us so who wants to take that one mike you do the most journeys you, I, you are, I probably you do the most here. i would say that you do need to do a good a degree more planning than perhaps you would do mm-hmm. if you had a, a, a petrol or diesel car um but it's i, I I quite enjoy the planning part of it the night before. I was going to work out where I'm going to stop. So I would say that um, you say you're worried about your app doesn't work. Well, you don't, you're not going to need one really, basically. You can you can yeah, travel the country pretty well without just a contactless card or whatever. So I don't I wouldn't stress about that. I would say just use ZapMap or one of the, the uh, sort of roaming apps um, and you can filter those. I tend to filter those by charging stations that have got more than three or more than four charging points. Um, and then just sort of plan it there and just say, well, generally speaking, your backside or your bladder is going to give out probably before the range, certainly on an iX3 has finished. So you don't want to top up when you're at 80%, but equally, you know, you don't want to wait, go all the way the way and just have it at very low percentage. So yeah, I always try and plan something after about two hours. And I'm sure you you guys are the same. So yeah, just plan it. And then, you know, if you use something like Zatamap, it will tell you what the, what the brand is, whether they take contactless, whether you need an app, um, and just go from there. Just just plan it and, and enjoy it, really, because it's um, once you've done it, it, you've got over it. It's it's not stressful at all, is it? Especially if you're kind of thinking that you're going to aim to somewhere that's got you know five six charges. You're pretty much guaranteed to to get on without waiting. I'm a terrible planner. I never plan it. I'm absolutely awful. <laughs> but I, I I think what you will, my advice would be, Glenn, that I I actually use now increasingly just the map on my iPhone. Because I think actually you can get some really good charging information from that as well. And I just tend to stick to charging um, providers that I know work and are mostly reliable. And I think we all probably do the same thing. You know, I do. They're more more expensive. I think they're the most expensive at the moment. But Instavolt are reliable, deliver pretty fast charges. I think if you do regular journeys, like I know I do a journey down to Cornwall a couple of times, three, four times a year. I've found two charging stops now. One is Molly's Diners. That's always my tip for you. There's only a couple of them, but they're great. It's they're very reliable. Grid server on the charges there. And I think it feels really daunting at first, but you will just get to know where your charging stops are on longer journeys. Grid server are are upgrading all of the uh, charging network on the motorways. Not everyone has been done yet. That is something that you can check beforehand because there's a lot of the really fast charges going on. The other thing I'd say is avoid peak times. So if you can, you know, if if you know you're going to be hitting a motorway on a bank holiday Monday and it's going to be busy, I would always come off the motorway. And I think it's often worth coming off to, you know, a charger, which is just off. And again, a sort of interval, a lot of those brands will have chargers that are just nicely positioned off the exit. Mm. But I would just say don't panic about it. Mm. Just chill because there's so many options around and, you know, and the infrastructure is getting better. Um, I mean, obviously, the way to do it is is the way Mike does it. I'm just not that organised, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but I've never run out of charge. <laughs> and also, the other thing you get used to as well is that whole thing that you your charger starts to learn. You know, you start to so you start to learn your your own car's range. I always know that when when I get come off the motorway. You know, I know what I can get down to. I know the range will boost up and I know I've got enough to get home. So you do start to understand what your car's capable of as well. And you'll get definitely get to learn that. So let us know how you get on when you've done a long journey. Yeah. Um, the, OK, this is from World of Cars. I don't know whether World of Cars was on um, it sounds uh, like... YouTube or an email. Yeah, yeah, it was YouTube. YouTube. It was YouTube. Uh, OK, OK. When looking at secondhand electric cars, can you get things like charging speeds upgraded when the manufacturers offer differing ones when new? Thinking of an Enyaq 80, and if I go for one with 100 kilowatt charging, can it be upgraded to 125 kilowatt uh, for future proofing the vehicle when it comes to selling it again? Okay. Tom, do you want to take that one? Mm. Well, 
I think there have been a few over-the-air updates and probably some dealer updates that have allowed people to charge faster and have also unlocked a few more miles in the range. But uh, there are other cars where the upgrade in the charging speed has been an upgrade in the actual hardware. It's been the inverter. So in that case, obviously, you won't be able to do it. You're not just going to be able to take out the battery and the inverter and bolt in a new one. Uh, but if it's one of the uh, software updates, that might have happened. So you might just find that you plug in one day and suddenly you're getting a charger that, that uh, or a charger that's much faster. So in those cases, you don't have to do anything apart from maybe take it into a dealer and get it serviced. Mm-hmm. Um, in uh, in some other cases, no, you're going to be you're going to be a bit knackered because you need actual hardware changes. Uh, Mike, anything to in, add? In, yeah, in that specific case with the Enyaq, which is something I know a little bit more about, um, yeah, you can because it's a slightly wrong-headed decision. I don't know if you remember back to when the Enyaq was launched. It was launched with 50 kilowatt charging, but for 400 quid, you could upgrade um, to faster charging, but it was just purely a software uh, change. But they kind of junked that after about three months, I think. It wasn't long, was it, before they kind of saw sense and, and changed that. But yes, certainly with Enyaq, um, it's exactly the same hardware. Um, they've just through software updates allowed it to charge at home. They were probably hedging their bets. They didn't want to worry about damaging the battery and obviously got data back from those early cars that showed that there was no problem at all. Um, so yes, yeah, so my understanding is ME3 um, software update on all those ENYACs and uh, ID models, that allows for over-the-air updates, which means that um, the ME3 one automatically unlocks the faster. So, but if you're buying one from a, a dealer, you'd kind of expect that to have been done they expect it to be flashed with the latest uh, you know mm-hmm. dealers and dealers aren't they so that might not necessarily be the case but to answer the question fundamentally yes you can certainly with that car uh change it but as tom says there may be other ones that are limited by the by the hardware but um yeah so uh, certainly in that case yeah you can do it on an enyaq and, and don't forget that, please, if you have any questions, including your car buying conundrums, if you're trying to decide what car you want to buy, we are here to help you. You can email us at podcast at electrifying.com or let us know in the comments below. So should I rattle through? We've already, you know, we're way over time, but let me Always. just go through. And we've had some great comments in on the subject of the Alpha from Sunny D. Your opinion is wrong generally. The, the Milano Alpha <laughs> looks amazing. Only problem is the power output is too low for a sporty looking Alpha. You yep. go for it, Sonny. Yep. I, I, you know, we, we'll drive it. We will report back. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder and all yep. that. Um, Colin Renfrew, um, Alfa Romeo uh, controversy, interesting. The hybrid has a different grille, which is way better. Traditional, yes, yes right. yeah, of course. Is. But yeah, um, uh, Alfa has always produced some controversial cars. Overall memorable. Calm down. He said to calm down. Yeah, God. it's just funny. I think more than anything. Uh, Chris Townsend, I like the look of the Alpha. Certainly far better looking than the 600E. Yeah, but that wouldn't have been too difficult, would it? Because oh, that harsh. is quite a boring look. It's, bo- it's just boring, isn't it? A bit boring. Eh? Yeah. 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 It's just a bit dull. Mm. Um, uh, uh, Ashtaroth, I like the Milano more than its sister cars. I, th- I actually don't mind the way it looks, actually, but the Jeep no, Avenger no. does hold a special place in our hearts, including Manos, our head of production, who I think loves that car more oh, than his God. very he beautiful girlfriend. Um, but yeah, there we go. He adores it. Uh, who wants to take the the Tes the cheap cars? I feel like I'm hogging the comments. Do you want to do no, the Tes the no, cheap cars? No, that's fine. Comments, we had Mike? we had Alex Pratt uh, who wrote in and said, "I'm really disappointed that a leading EV promoter such as yourself would report on in, in inverted commas fake news designed to have a negative mm. impact on EV sales without adding a stronger rebuttal than you did." Um, obviously, when that story broke, the Tesla were going to can the twenty five thousand pound car. Um, there was no rebuttal from Tesla, but afterwards, um, Elon Musk uh, tweeted to say that Reuters, the original source of the story, were lying. Um, didn't reply, didn't supply any other details. So um, we can only really go from what we know. So you know, given that uh, Musk said in 2019 that there will be a million Tesla Robo taxis on the road by the end of 2020, I'm not entirely sure who's peddling the fake news on that one um star lord um in all caps which a few of our tesla comments were in all caps it has to be said uh tesla have a robo taxi reveal on 8th of the 8th this year and the 25 car is still alive so say elon so and we, we must always trust the word of elon you know he speaks the <laughs> truth exactly so um <laughs> Um, and if I go on to one, one more, the general ransom, uh, finish off on one. Um, your Grandland preview made me chuckle. He said, as a, this is from Marky147. He said, as a current Grandland owner who is about to hand it back for an ID4, 
I'll be interested to see if the new Grand Line can tempt me back in three years' time. So that's that's interesting, isn't it? He's come from a Grand Line, he's going to go to an ID4, and the Grand Line might be quite good. Absolutely. We might chase the wrong car. So, I- yes, let us know, Marky. And if you aren't already, do make sure you um, subscribe to the channel because we just yes. might have an interesting video about the Grand Land, which is dropping in the next few days. Um, so, yeah, please, if you are interested in that car, make sure that you watch that one, which is coming your way. I'm going to end with one final quick one. Um, anonymous PDG. Ford Explorer is available to configure an order. Will you be reviewing it anytime soon? It's We'd on my to list to consider, well, along with the Countryman, EX30, Kia EV3, maybe the Ford Puma. We've got no idea, actually, whether we'll be reviewing it anytime soon at all. It's a complete mystery. That car is apparently... You know, it exists, but I don't think any reviewers have seen it yet. But you will know about it as soon as we do. And if you aren't already, as I said, do make sure you subscribe to the channel. And please, if you're listening on your podcast platforms, follow us and leave comments and share because it really helps uh, build the audience on the podcast, which, of course, is what we want to do so we can keep making it. Any final thoughts to leave our lovely electrifiers on? No, not really. Have a Not a week. bit flat. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> and on that note of high, I think we will call it quits. Uh, nothing like leaving your audience on a high. Thanks very much for listening. This has been the Kilowatt Half Hour. Goodbye from all of us. Bye. Bye. Bye.